So I would like to welcome Paula Clark to the Life with the Lionesses, the Women in Rugby League project. Um, and welcome to this um, episode, Paula. Uh, just to say that it's just so important to me and, and sort of part of the project, what we're trying to do is not just to recognise, obviously, players, which obviously were a part and parcel of, of the Lioness tours, but people that actually played a real um, off-field role um, and, and a very pivotal one in your case, because you were the physio for the 1996 and 1998 tour. Um, and I have memories of you patching up players uh, to get them back on the pitch uh, to make sure that they could actually be, be fit to play. So welcome. Thank you. Thank um, you so, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, Paula. So could you tell us a bit more about how you got involved in rugby league, you know, your connection with rugby league and... Is it where you were born and sort of, of how, how you got involved, really? No, no, no background in rugby league um, at all. My first contact was rugby union. Um, and I started my private practice when my children were tiny. And I was really just shopping around trying to get anybody to, to send me work, which included knocking on doors, GPs, and saying... I'm a physio, setting up a private practice, please will you send me some patients? One of which was a GP who played rugby union and he was fed up of going along to play rugby on a Saturday afternoon and being expected to look after all the injuries as well. And so it was he who got me involved in touchline work. Um, my husband was still was playing, but with that um, a club different to the one in fact that I started working at. And so it was very much making it up as it goes along. There were no female, female physios at that time working in York, other than um, Bernadette Scatchard, who was York Rugby League uh, physiotherapist. And so I did about a season and a half with them. And um, yeah, I, just acted confidently and applied all the basic principles of being a physio. Knew from having watched it on touch from Touchline, and then Bernadette moved on to Castleford, and so the job at York Rugby League became available, and so I made that transition then because nobody else was applying for the job anyway. So, so you were you were in one of the first uh, women physios physiotherapists then, wouldn't you have been? Yeah, well, Ber Bernadette Scatchard, um, I think she was first in the professional game, mm. and Jeanette, whose name escapes me. Yeah, she was at St Helens, wasn't she? Yeah, at Saint, yeah, around yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, then it expanded quite rapidly. But, so Bernadette was at Castleford for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was a young girl uh, running out there. and I... Yeah, you don't need to add that bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Young girl. laughs> no, this project's making me feel really old, Paula. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> oh, dear, I remember seeing the women physios and growing in numbers um, uh -huh. as the profession sort of grew and more and more women got involved. Yeah. Um, in rugby well, league itself. Yeah, well, there was a Rugby League Medical Association, and we used to meet up about once a month, and it, you, and there were doctors there, as well as, as physios, and who were, who called themselves physios, who were, weren't, um, they were sponge men, and that became quite a bone of contention, really, as the game became more and more professional, ensuring the qualifications of the players of the, sorry, of the physios looking after the players was, um, was a professional one and um, we couldn't get sued. Absolutely. Well, I remember, you know, the book, the person with the bucket, someone yeah. had been knocked out and then putting a sponge on their head and expecting them to <laughs> carry mm. on, mm. particularly in the days of the, where concussion wasn't even recognised, was it? Well, when I, when I first went to, to your reunion, there was the aforementioned on the touchline and I managed to get that in the first year and it was the site of a yeah the, sp the sponge being used on some sweaty part of somebody's body 
but then somebody running off the pitch, picking up a sponge to wipe off the blood off their face, mm. putting it back in the bucket. And then oh, wow. else taking, a, taking the sponge and having a, a drink of water out of it. So I just help them to appreciate the hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> A, a, bit, a bit like the, the freeze spray can, which um, I never actually replaced after the first one was empty. <laughs> it's, it was like a whole new era for sport, really, and rugby in particular, wasn't it? Bringing that professional mm. side mm. of the importance mm. of injury management and being mm -hmm. able to manage those injuries, actually, so you had more longevity, really, as a player. Yeah, yeah. And, and now they're virtually paramedics. Yeah. yeah. At the level at which they're they're trained to, um, and so yeah, there were a lot of mistakes that were being made purely because nobody knew any better. I would hasten to add that none of those mistakes were life-threatening type mistakes, but things like having a suitable stretcher, like for example. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. things have really moved on, thank goodness. I remember having players walking around the pitch concussed and being thrown mm -hmm. back on as well uh, mm -hmm. with whatever injuries. Um, yeah. So th thank goodness we've begun to move on. Yes, uh, and us having to, not just the, the female physios, but the males as well, start to get the respect for the decisions that they could make and not being overridden by the coach who was desperate to keep the player on the pitch. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Goodness, yeah, it's like a whole um, culture change, really, and it's a shift, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes persuading the referee to just, you know, don't be too hasty to get this game underway. This person actually needs some, some attention here. Please <laughs> <laughs> don't let the ball go over my head again. Yeah, absolutely. So how many years were you at York? Uh, 11, I think. 11, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So how did you get, because you worked a bit for the Rugby Football League as well, didn't you? Yeah, you? yeah. Um, I worked with um, GB Academy for two seasons when John Keir was the coach. And that was a job that was advertised and and I got. And then um, <laughs> when I began to realise that the players were still being play, paid, by their professional clubs, many of whom were a substantial amount, getting substantial amounts, and I was getting not. And um, I, I did a bit of research and got examples of what other female physios in other sports were getting and presented it to, to the coach. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep that one off record. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't go down well. No, uh, and I, I, I elected to not continue doing that, that role. Mm. That, in fact, um, was when I got the phone call to see if I was interested in working with, with the women. Oh, that's interesting. Fascinating. Mm. It's interesting, mm. isn't it, that women so many, and I remember in the 1998 tour when um, I went across to referee, They'd actually said, and I didn't realise, I didn't think they had any women referees, and it wasn't until I got there I found out that they'd said the men could be paid, but not the women referees. So the women had all said, well, we're not going to referee then, and I hadn't realised that at the time. Oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah, so similar, isn't it? That, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I think, as, as I said um, off, off, offline, I think there's a whole... Um, PhD study on on uh, this sort of social and women and in roles within rugby league mm -hmm. and whether they're uh, valued for what they do. Yes. Uh, yeah. So fascinating. So tell us. So you started for Great Britain Lionesses then. Mm. Um, so you were cut. You who who contacted you then and how did you get involved? Ian, Ian Harris. And um, anticipating this conversation, I don't know where Ian Harris got my name from. So that's maybe him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In his memoir somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll have to ask so, him. To to but me. I, the, the, the squad, the players have been together for a while before I became involved. Um, 
and then it was around the time that there was um, there was previously someone who was doing was going to be the tour manager, and that I can't even remember his name because he was around for such a short period of time after I started. And then that's when Nikki Carter got involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, because the the flights hadn't been booked ten weeks out and things like that, had they? <laughs> there was a lot of work for. Good job they called on the expert Nikki Carter. Yes. Yes, and it was she and I roomed together um, that first tour. <laughs> yes, there were a lot of problems to be sorted out behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, and I've still got this image of her with the uh, bag of money strapped to her wrist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I always remember as well, sort of Paula, around you know the professionalism that you brought within that because it was, you know, the it was all new, particularly for the women around going abroad and ca carrying medical equipment, but the right medical equipment to make sure sort of the players and obviously the players were coming from a real basic base, wasn't it, of club rugby where they probably had never um, had a physiotherapist at all within the club. Yeah. So I was. I was involved with, uh, at training sessions whenever I could possibly get there. And so it was introducing a whole new culture to the players as well about management, um, some of which didn't always go down well because some of the, the highly motivated in, individuals just wanted to carry on regardless. And so there was a degree... Quite, in fact, quite a large degree of education went on, um, which at the time I, I didn't think anything of. That's just a way that I knew that I needed to be able to do the job and to get the respect and get them to actually tell me what, what they were feeling as far as physical injuries were concerned and what decisions needed to be, to be made. And just taping it up wasn't always an option. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, how it evolved after that professionalism, because something a part of this project is where it started in 96 and how it just got more and more professional as, as mm -hmm. it moved on, making sure, and well before its time, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in, the, in the sport. There was a sport psychologist involved. Yeah. What was it, Claire? Yeah, Claire Wood, initially. Um, yeah, and then Joe yeah. came in after that. Yeah, and so that that again, that was quite a a massive change to a group of of girls as well as women who really just haven't been exposed to to anything like that at all. And again, some far more receptive than others. Mm. So tell us about that first tour then, that 1996 and uh, the preparation for it. And you, because obviously you didn't have long to prepare really to then go no, out with the players. No. Well, having done, because I, I had previously done an international tour. In fact, with York Rugby League. That was the first Rugby League tour I did. We went to Russia. And so in preparation for, for that, I did a lot of research, speaking to other physios that had travelled abroad and, all that I needed to, to research well in advance. Um, and just how on earth did you plan for X number of matches, X number of training sessions? How many rolls of tape do you need? How, and, and the things like testing, testing for players' intolerances and, and allergies and putting together or getting a suitable vessel are actually carrying all this stuff in and getting permission to take an ultrasound machine, for example, on an aeroplane and what certification you had to have with you, but also the research that needed to be done to take it into another country. And yeah, that was a, a fair amount of groveling had to go on to get the... Uh, all the medical supplies at a favourable cost. Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously budget was a, a big oh, one, wasn't it? Or lack yes. of budget, should I say. Yes, yes, indeed. 
and the um, the weight of the trunk again I'm trying to think about all the, the practical problems that we had because it was heavy and it did need at least two people to carry it and there was one of the airports <laughs> that the, uh, the luggage handlers wouldn't actually lift it and we had to get we had to get players to go behind the scenes to actually carry it, lift it onto a conveyor belt. <laughs> Follows trunk. <laughs> well, I wasn't involved with carrying some, something that last size and weight. Um, and they, you know, sharing, sharing a room with Nikki, but also at that, that first tour, I didn't have a dedicated medical room. So it was Nikki and I sharing the room, but then me doing all the all the physio stuff as well. And it becoming a, a little bit of a, a meeting place. And I think in uh, in Sydney at one point we actually did pay for an upgrade. She and I got a room. <laughs> So we had a bit more privacy. Mm. And then we just we learned from that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, certainly in New Zealand, I insisted that there had to be a separate medical room. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you say, it becomes a meeting place, doesn't it? And actually it's more than just physical, isn't it? Yeah. It's the mental, you know, it's the mental preparation and the being away for a month and, and all the things. And a lot of players have talked about that, how they used to gather in in the medical room to just offload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we needed some downtime as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you did need your own space and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So have you got yeah. any memories then of the actual tour itself, um, of uh, the games or, or off-field or on-field stuff? Um, I'm embarrassed to say no, not really. But the more you've, you were talking before we started about other players' memories. I think it's more the probably the social, the social event. And um, and they th as a as a representative team, the things that organized for us to do, which we needed to go along to, and some of the players not being too keen on engaging in that and having to be diplomatic on occasions about <laughs> trying to help them understand why you've got you've got a GB shirt on your back on the pitch and you've got a, a GB badge on your blazer and you've got to act as a representative of Great Britain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's interesting to say it was the first one as well. So it's, yes, they sing the national anthems, but it's actually a, a big step up from club rugby, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But singing the national anthem, Nobody had thought to rehearse that. Oh no. And so the the embarrassment of being on the pitch to sing the national anthem and hardly anybody knew the words. And so <laughs> that first night, that's one of the things I insisted on. Well, and Nikki agreed with me. Everybody had to practice the words for the national anthem. Yeah. Yeah, so important, isn't it, <laughs> to bond as a team? <laughs> but yes, some of them, with the greatest of respect, the backgrounds they came from, they'd had no need to sing the national anthem previously. Mm. Yeah, and but do you know the, uh, the what's come from the interviews is the amount that were so proud to sing it when they did sing it. Mm. So all that work of you and Nikki <laughs> <laughs> did us really proud. So do you remember uh, much then? So obviously your job was to, to obviously keep them fit, healthy, um, mm. repair. And I know physio having now worked uh, on a lot of tours, but also a lot of camps for um, different players, the amount of hours a physio has to wait, it's on call, isn't it? It's not mm. just um, not just mm. game day or, or anything like that. It's just 24-7 when you're on tour. How did you manage all of that? Uh, it was a job that needed so yeah we got got on with it really um and there were yeah a, a few issues behind the scenes but i've made sure that I, I knew people before i went 
I have names of physios. And interestingly, in, in Sydney, there was a, a physio who's now got a big private practice in Leeds. She done, she'd been at York as a junior grade physio, and she'd done some touch line work with me just to get experience. And um, so I kept in touch with her. So she was a great resource and she facilitated some of the things that I needed to organise, including for Nikki. Mm. Her on her feet. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Oh, and I always remember you, you, you patching me up in New Zealand as well. So you were an absolute godsend that I'd never have refereed without you. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, the responsibilities at, at that time of having all, all medical records, because I was obligated as a, as a physio to have gathered all that information and have the emergency contact numbers. Um, and the GDPR didn't really exist at that time, but for me as a physiotherapist, medical records I, I had to be, seen to be accountable for. The management of what I did and why I did it, and the decisions sometimes reluctantly from the player's point of view to take somebody to hospital, more of them to be taken to hospital, and then communicating with the medical services. Yeah, yeah, of course, because that's another big thing, isn't it? Once they're injured, it's about having the personnel to be able to be with them in hospital, isn't it? And yes, but also mm, being able what else needed doing mm. and there were, there were times and I, I learned that with time at York with Billy um, if at all possible I didn't go with the injured player to the hospital because there was still a team that needed me mm. Mm. but making sure that we knew where they'd been taken yeah absolutely <laughs> get them back from Carlisle on a, on a cold windy day <laughs> which hospital did they go to well I don't know <laughs> They just took them. <laughs> and that was the ambulance driver. <laughs> oh dear. So I'd, I'd, you know, although I'd been worked in the men's game, yes, there was an awful lot that I learned probably without re realizing I'd learned it. Maybe a physiotherapist without a few years' experience wouldn't necessarily have been able to pull all those ends together. Mm, yeah. And an absolute pioneer for it, really, you know, an absolute, as I say, God's part of the tour. Um, you know, you can't manage without your physios because, as I say, you you um, patch them up, you make the help coaches make decisions. And so what was it like part being of the squad and actually coming back with the ashes? Um, it was a bit surreal because, um, and I don't think it was till I heard other people's pride and thought, yeah, I, I did actually contribute to that. The only reason I had boots on my feet to stop me slipping when I had to run across the pitch, and I wasn't a player, but I could see what they were doing, and I also knew what they needed to be able to do. Mm. And so trying to facilitate that and, um, yeah, as you were saying, patching them up sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And coming back with the Ashes. And actually, it's the last team, male or female, to ever beat the Australians. So it's mm. a pretty historic tour mm. uh, to be involved with. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Look, well, one of the things after we um, first talked about me doing this interview was going back to the medical box and the size bit. I, I can't recall how we actually got it down to London because we. We flew out of Heathrow, I think. Was it in the back of the coach? Probably. Yeah, yeah, but, that's interesting. And you know, I've been on other tours, Paula, and nobody's ever taken a medical kit like you took. <laughs> oh. Honestly, I've, on the tours I've been with all the different teams, uh, they've gone to the countries and relied on them helping them supply their medical equipment. Oh, I couldn't do with that degree. No. Security. I wanted. Yeah. yeah, I had to know what exactly what I had for all eventualities. Mm. Taking crutches from home. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember them being on the plane. I think. 
<laughs> you know, that's because somebody was using them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so, uh, yeah, the, the crux is that there's a story, Shan, Shani, she had the crutches for an injury when we went to Brisbane, when we were in Brisbane. And one of the down days, we went to a big park in the middle of Brisbane, and there was like a beach area at the side of a lagoon. Yeah, and the crutches got full of sand. <laughs> I remember having to rehabilitate the crutches. <laughs> There'll be some photographs somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So you did the 96, you came back, and then you decided that you'd uh, do 1998 tour as well to New Zealand. So you kept on with the team. Yeah, I don't know that it was a decision that I had any option for, really. And it had been a valuable experience. And um, the friends I've made. Mm. And, um, yeah. Why shouldn't I do another one? <laughs> Absolutely. So what 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 was the difference in tours then that you found from sort of your point of view? You know, what did you bring in differently and and making oh. sure that it, you know, it was a different experience for the players? Well, the, the opposition, you know, we, we knew that it was not going to be, it was going to be a totally different type of game. And um, the, the New Zealand squad, right from the beginning it was evident they were fitter they were stronger and they were faster and um so that was going to present with different types of, of injury whereas i think in australia um the level of fitness that we went out with sometimes made up for um well it, it more than balanced out the 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 size and the bulk of some of the Australian players, because our girls were fist, uh, fitter and they were faster. But that wasn't the case when we got to New Zealand. And so it was being reactive. You can't plan for things like that. Mm. So I don't recall taking anything different at all, as far as equipment was concerned. Um, but again, I did the homework and I made sure that I had points of contact over there if I needed them. Mm. And the, the actual physicality was a lot mm -hmm. greater, wasn't it? So mm -hmm. I imagine the injuries were very different and, and the tiredness of the players. The fatigue, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think the... Um, and things like... And, and um, so one of the, going back to the, the things that were organised for us as a squad, things that we were expected to go along to, was when we were in Rotorua. The, uh, we were expected, well, we did go to MRI, but we were expected to sleep there as well in the meeting house. And it was just a load of mattresses. And I remember we were all really very tired and a lot of the players um, just weren't prepared to to buy into that and so um, we didn't and so that that was an unfortunate experience really mm. Mm. it was healthy yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I didn't actually get involved in anything other than probably sharing the players opinions mm. And a very important part of the team, actually, because you hear it when they're at the lowest as well, don't you? And, and as you say, mm. it becomes a bit of a, this is how I really am mentally and physically in, mm. in your physio room. Yeah, and you know, joking apart, I was a bit older than a lot of them and I had a few years, more years experience of life as well as experience as a physio. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so being able to take it all on board and, and, and repeat it back, which is really important part of the tour as well, because, you know, it wasn't an easy tour, that 98, because, mm. as you said, they were more physical and there was some, you know, some hard lessons learned, weren't there? Mm. Yeah. yeah. But it was, and I, I don't think it was because of how hard that had been that for me to, 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 to tours 
was probably enough. And, and I had young children, and it was almost easier when they were young and they didn't need me around for four or six weeks. There was a, a good network of support for them. And then as they got older, it was it was more difficult. Mm, absolutely. And I, I didn't I didn't do much more touch line work after that. Right. It exhausted you. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think was the um was the most challenging aspect of, of being involved? Um the the diplomacy sometimes um and the the expectations of some of the management team, I suppose, with with the players, uh, and the fact that they'd had to probably do so much fundraising, and the management team sometimes weren't as um, appreciative in some regards of that in that their expectate the expectations off the pitch were sometimes too demanding for these girls and women who'd had to raise all this money to get there to then be dictated to by some things that weren't entirely palatable mm, yeah and being able to manage that yes yeah yes and I, I, I was often piggy in the middle Mm. yeah yeah can imagine that because you know it's a long way from home isn't it and you want mm. to see the country you're in as well yes yeah and I seem to remember there was a day that I just said that's it I'm going <laughs> I went and hired a car and suddenly it was full of other people who died in the well <laughs> and did that just toured locally yeah yeah did something yeah. completely non rugby went and be tourists yeah, absolutely. Well, it's so intense, isn't it, a tour? Hmm. And they're not short tours either, whether they were three, three weeks, three, four weeks. Oh, more. Mm. Up with the same group of people for that length of time. Yeah, there, there, there were times that there were, there were pressures associated with that for everybody. And um, it wasn't if the there wasn't the opportunity to get some personal space mm. in a room on the road at any point. Mm. Yeah, because of course they were all sharing as well, weren't mm. they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of the accommodation wasn't always as brilliant as others. I mean, some of it was terrific. Yeah. 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 You're very diplomatic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more a bit about the positive um aspect of sort of being around the lionesses and, and going on those tours um well the opportunity to actually do it with an international squad and as i mentioned earlier on the friends mm -hmm. yeah which are still nice now lifelong <laughs> friends aren't they <laughs> yes yeah 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 so when you look back at what going on the tours and, and what you achieved, what, what were your thoughts around that? Well, achieve um, is, is a very word, sense of achievement. Yeah. We got it right. Oh, I felt I got it right. Um, I think the worst thing was that maybe we weren't right in retrospect. Um, some lessons that were almost impossible to, to put right very often because of lack of resources mm. you know having to do it on a shoestring yeah um, but i think um somebody with the organizational skills of, of, of nikki and the changes that she she made on the run really um and for example I think we were due to, when we were in Canberra, we were due to go by road up to Brisbane. Well, oh, which wow. And so she said, I don't know where got the money from. And suddenly the coach was cancelled. Um, I seem to remember going up to the airport with her from Canberra, <laughs> getting all these tickets, really 
reams and reams and reams of them. And so obviously that saved more or less a day. Mm, absolutely. And that would be, well, it would be at least, well, I know it's 12 hours from Sydney to Brisbane because I've been on that coach. So that would have been probably another 12, probably 24 hours travel. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And there was more than one occasion the coach that had been sent for us wasn't large enough to transport all the kit bags. And then I think, I think at one point they actually ended up with a minibus as well to take all the bags. Mm. So not only awesome. the playing kit, but you know, people's personal kit bags. <laughs> Amazing the resourcefulness and as you say the friendships the lifelong friendships really that have come from it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So when you watch sort of women's rugby league now and and where it is with the Super League and um and obviously a World Cup that's actually got parity, so mm -hmm. the women are being paired alongside the men. What 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 do you see for that next generation? What are your thoughts for that next generation? Well, opportunities that need um, appreciating maybe the younger ones need to understand and where it has come from and where they've come into it maybe help them appreciate it as well yeah absolutely it has come such a long way from those days hasn't it however you know i firmly believe in the more i do this project how far ahead of it the game they were as well um, you know, compared to other areas of the game, you know, with the women themselves and how they developed as a squad right to 2003. It's it's really amazing on and off field. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Paula, thank you. It's been absolute pleasure. Well, catching up with you again. Um, but actually, you know, from your experience and as a yeah, sorry, I'm bound to start remembering as well now. Yeah, you will. You'll, you'll say, Julie, can I do this interview again? <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I truly believe and as I started up that there were so many people off field that were that made the success of the lionesses uh, and obviously a physiotherapist is an important cog of that wheel and you are a pioneer of the sport that um, mm -hmm. people um, will might never have heard of so I'm, I'm really pleased that you agreed to doing this interview and, mm -hmm. and your involvement in 96 and 98 really took them to another level uh, mm -hmm. of professionalism and um and the game itself so thank you very much for being yeah, with you. it's my pleasure and uh, I, hope, I hope um once you actually get out on the road that it does um it proves successful and you do get some of the of the the women and the women girls to come along and contribute on the day if nothing else Oh, absolutely. They've got such brilliant stories of which you'll be able to tell when we have the exhibitions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Okay.